Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar on novel synthetic opioid detection. My name is Ellen Mantis and I'm the director of the Chemical Sciences Roundtable at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. For those not familiar with the roundtable, it provides a neutral forum to advance the understanding of issues of importance to the chemical sciences and promotes the exchange of information among government, industry, and academic sectors. This year, we are excited to launch a series of webinars on emerging topics. This is the second in our series. Our first topic was on bioinorganic hybrids, and presentations and recordings from that webinar are available on the CSR website. Today, we will be discussing the challenges of detecting novel synthetic or counterfeit opioids in the field and ways in which to address those challenges. The format will consist of one overview presentation followed by two in-depth presentations. There will be time for one or two clarifying questions after each presentation, but all other questions will be addressed in our discussion time after the presentations have been completed. Dr. Linda Broadbelt will be our moderator for this webinar. She is the co-chair of the Chemical Sciences Roundtable and Sarah Rebecca Rowland Professor in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering and the Associate Dean for Research of the McCormick School of Engineering and Applied Science at Northwestern University. She will be taking over for me after the overview presentation and she will be asking the questions on behalf of the audience. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A button on Zoom located in the bottom control panel. The chat feature has been disabled for audience members. For those tuning in via live stream on the CSR website, please submit questions by email to csr at nas.edu. With that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Jonathan McGrath. Dr. McGrath is a senior policy analyst with the National Institute of Justice and the Office of Investigative and Forensic Sciences. He has experience with examinations of forensic evidence, including controlled substances and mobile field operation, and currently supports several forensic science initiatives at NIJ. The floor is yours, Dr. McGrath. All right, thank you, Ellen. And I just wanna thank uh, the NAS and the Chemical Sciences Roundtable for the opportunity to provide this overview for this very important topic. I also wanna thank the other staff at NAS and our presenters, uh, Barry Logan and Marcella uh, Naharo, who have been great partners uh, in addressing these issues from both a forensic science point of view and a public health and public safety point of view. So I'm gonna to try to advance my slides now. And just want to provide a DOJ disclaimer that any opinions or points of view that I express are, are those of my, my own. And so to start with in providing an overview of the opioid crisis and the role of chemistry to combat the emerging uh, drug threats, including synthetic opioids, I want to provide a, a quick overview of some of the, the data that comes out of CDC uh, in the mortality uh, data sets. So CDC has identified several trends in opioid uh, emergence. Uh, going back to the 1990s with prescription drugs and then also with a, a turn towards heroin in the early 2010s. And then we see a significant rise in synthetic opioid use and overdose deaths starting in about 2013. And you can see from the death uh, statistics that are provided by CDC through 2018, there's been somewhat, there's been a dramatic increase in the use of prescription and other opioids. You see a slight decrease in total opioid deaths uh, over the last uh, year or so. Uh, but that trend has not been the same for synthetic opioids. Those such as fentanyl and fentanyl analogs and other analogs of opioids or, or other chemical structures related to those opioids have actually surged even further, even though we're seeing uh, slight uh, decreases in deaths. This is a very important issue from both the public health and public safety sides. So what are the considerations that we should look at for today's topic? So what does the drug landscape look like? Uh, DEA, or the Drug Enforcement Administration, schedules controlled substances between Schedules 1 and 5, where Schedules 1 are, have no, are substances with no current acceptable med medical use in the United States, Schedules 2 having uh, uh, some medical use but having high potential for abuse, and that, that same thing is true with the lower schedules as well, of having lower potential for abuse. So between the DEA and the Office of National Drug Control Policy, a uh, national drug control strategy is issued every year and provides a really good detail as to the landscape uh, from both public health and public safety data sets across the federal, state, and local landscapes. So what information is needed 
to address these issues of novel synthetic opioids, in particular for today's talk and looking at field detection and identification. So the information that's needed and why are that these chemical structures of novel synthetic opioids are similar to those of known controlled substances, and these synthetic opioids are being designed at, at a rate and pace to stay ahead of federal and international laws that restrict the distribution and sale of these specific drugs. So traditionally, in order to investigate and prosecute controlled substance analog cases, the structural characterization of drugs or the metabolites is essential to demonstrate that the substance is both substance, substantially similar in chemical structure to a controlled substance or ha and has the substantially similar pharmacological effect as those controlled substances, such as stimulant, depressant, hallucinogenic uh, effects on the central nervous system. So going back uh, a few years, DEA has been, been able to use its uh, temporary scheduling authorities to issue re new regulations on these drugs, these new drugs and their analogs. And in 2018, DA was able to schedule uh, uh, a, a uh, regulation that is commonly referred to as the Core Structure Scheduling Act for fentanyl-related analogs. And that was to allow uh, uh, additional actions to be taken to avoid imminent hazardous threats to public safety with these new analogs that are hitting the drug markets. So one of the operational gaps is in collecting this preliminary information for, uh, predominantly at the field level. And who collects this information? This may be law enforcement or crime scene techs or death investigators. And as we'll see from the presentations, we'll see the other considerations for what, the, what considerations are needed to collect this information in the field. And the goal here is to collect this information in a timely manner to then provide actionable information that others can use, both to identify hotspots, but then also trends across the country and then also within jurisdictions themselves. And it's not just the technology that needs to be developed, but it's also taking that technology and implementing it into current workflows to ensure that the, the information is accurate, is provided at the right time, and can be used to then uh, assist the drug chemists with their identifications of the drugs. So how can chemists get involved? The final two slides that I'll show in my overview provide a set of links to resources and further information uh, to to consider different new ways to, uh, to advance research for these types of, of issues. And you'll see from our presenters um, where you can find additional information as well. So I wanna to refer to DEA's National Forensic Laboratory Information System, which is a, a central repository for data that's coming out of our nation's crime labs at the federal, state, and local levels. And so as I mentioned before, getting the preliminary information within a case to the labs and to the medical examiners and coroners and to those toxicologists are incredibly helpful to help uh, initiate those types of testing strategies. And the NIFLIS data demonstrate a significant increase in the number and diversity of new and emerging fentanyl-related substances, in particular, in forensic casework starting in 2015. And each newly identified substance requires additional research, development, and implementation of laboratory methods, testing protocols, and advanced technologies and equipment to ensure sufficient sensitivity and specificity to detect these emerging drugs and forensic casework. Increased education awareness is needed to standardize the analysis and reporting of these substances, particularly for drug death investigations and working closely with medical examiners and coroners. The death certificates need specific details of these drugs involved in the death to ensure the completeness and the accuracy of the drug death statistics and to avoid undercounting. This comprehensive toxicology data is also comes from driving under the influence of drug cases and motor fatality, motor vehicle fatality cases to ensure that more information is provided on the prevalence and use of these opioids, fentanyls, and other analogs. In 2019, the Department of Justice issued a report to Congress alongside NIJ on the needs assessment of forensic laboratories and medical examiner corner offices. And I heavily encourage those in the audience to read the 13 pages in the report that discuss the opioid crisis and emerging drug threats in particular. It discusses the continuous emergence of the new drugs and drug mixtures that need to be analyzed by the stakeholders that I've mentioned. It also cites that an additional $270 million was needed in 2015, simply to address the impact of these new drug and toxicology cases coming into the laboratories. And this number is a cost estimate is associated with the optimal balance of getting the request into the laboratory and issuing the reports back out to the customers in a timely manner. This report also identified that expenditure increases increase for, for both drugs and toxicology uh, in these years. And this 37% increase in expenditures was needed for drugs and controlled substance analysis, 25% increase in toxicology analysis. And this compares with about 3% increase in expenditures for other forensic disciplines in the same time frame. There's been a dramatic uh, increase 
in the the number of turnaround the amount of turnaround time to turn turn over the drug casework between 2011 and 2017 the turnaround time increased from 58 days to 79 days for drug cases and for these same drug cases the backlog soared from 30, 385 cases to over 1200 cases so it was a 225 percent increase so the preliminary uh, drug testing that can occur in the field is incredibly important to help uh, to help uh, create efficient workflows and efficiencies within the laboratory environment to get those appropriate information about the drugs to the stakeholders. This rep report also identified that resources are needed to help forensic laboratories coordinate with public safety and public health officials in order to implement field detection equipment to develop that actionable information and share data in a timely manner. And this report also identified a promising practice in deploying that field portable drug detection instrumentation to provide this preliminary results and also triage casework in coordination with the labs for operational management and oversight. I want to turn to uh, some of the forensic science research that has been conducted both at NIJ and across the federal landscape amongst the federal agencies. In 2015, NAS issued a report on the support for forensic science research at NIJ and our role in, that, in this area. And we also issued a report looking at the federal investments of forensic science R&D nationwide. And as I mentioned in these final two slides, I've provided links to additional resources that you can find. They're free resources and they're available to the public. So whether you're a student, researcher, practitioner, or just want to learn more information about these forensic science issues, are interested in applying your chemistry and scientific expertise towards these criminal justice system issues and their intersection with public health and public safety problems, please visit these resources and funding opportunities for additional information. And as I mentioned, uh, several of these uh, additional uh, papers have contributed to some of the workshops and forums and symposia that we've been a part of across the forensic sciences to address these issues. And these are just some additional uh, information to provide uh, additional uh, uh, background for this type of topic. And I want to uh, point out in particular the opioid detection challenge that was funded by DHS last year was uh, specifically to address the detection of, of opioids and other drugs um, within the, the environments in the field. So I encourage you to check out these resources and I, I thank everyone again. I'm happy to answer questions either now or at the end of the presentation. So I'll, I'll turn it back over to our moderator. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Uh, so this is Linda Broadbelt. Um, and there is one question that was um, levied during uh, your presentation. Perhaps this will be addressed in the additional presentations. So feel free to uh, punt it forward if you'd like. Uh, but the question comes to us and asks, have you seen phenethyl 4 ANPP? And if so, would you classify it as a precursor for fentanyl? fentanyl-like uh, for ANPP. So maybe this is about kind of the, the range of uh, compounds you're seeing with this specific one of interest. I'm going to punt that to, uh, to my colleagues. Uh, they're all speaking next, but I'll also do some background research and provide additional information where I can um, on that particular, particular chemical. Thank you. Yeah, but, uh, specific ones are going to come up during the, the uh, subsequent presentation. So this might be addressed there. All right, if there are no uh, further clarifying questions, and uh, as a reminder, we'll save the uh, uh, questions, uh, substantive questions for uh, at the end uh, during the discussion. Uh, but it's my then a pleasure uh, to just thank you, Dr. McGrath, and introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Barry Logan, who will speak to some of the analytical considerations for in-field detection. Dr. Logan is Senior Vice President of Forensic Sciences and Chief Scientist at NMS Labs and Executive Director at the Center for Forensic Science Research and Education at the Frederick Reader's Family Foundation. Uh, he works with forensic toxicology and analytical chemistry to understand the effects of illicit and prescription drugs on drivers and drug caused and related death. His recent work has focused on the analytical interpretive toxicology and chemistry of novel psychoactive substances. So uh, without further ado, I uh, open the floor to uh, Dr. Logan. Uh, thank you, Linda, and thank you to the NES for the opportunity to share some of this with you today. 
Uh, just by way of my disclaimer, I will mention some uh, techniques and products here today, but they should not be construed as uh, any endorsement of any uh, particular product or uh, organization. Um, so um, I'm going to talk uh, uh, about the technologies that are available for use for detection of uh, novel opioids in the field. Um, I think uh, many of you may have experience with taking technology from the laboratory out into the field and recognize that there are uh, um, compromises and uh, considerations that, that have to be uh, accounted for when you make that transition. Um, they can include things like the, what's the level of sense, uh, an acceptable level of sensitivity for a test, what's the degree of complexity of a test that can be done in the field versus in the laboratory, uh, in the case of testing for drugs, um, whether you're testing to a menu uh, of things that you may be looking for versus um, the ability to identify something novel or, or new that hasn't been seen before, uh, may be better suited to a laboratory environment. Um, and then considerations about um, the stability of an instrument in the field, its robustness, if it's been moved around, its portability, if it has to be moved from place to place. Um, mean that we don't test for, for substances in the field the same way that we do in the, the laboratory. And uh, many times we think of drug testing as being a forensic uh, test, uh, which often it is for, for a criminal justice purpose, but uh, also uh, there are uh, numerous other uh, applications that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about. And um, in the forensic environment, um, we are uh, constrained by the expectations of the court in terms of having both presumptive and confirmatory data to support an identification. Um, the field is uh, increasingly and uh, appropriately regulated to ensure the forensic and scientific validity and, and reliability of the testing that is performed. Uh, the accreditation environment in a, in a crime laboratory is very different today from what it was uh, even 10 years ago. Um, the National Academy of Sciences report on strengthening forensic science in the United States uh, went a long way towards uh, accelerating the implementation of uh, quality systems and uh, validation in some of the, the, the science that's used uh, in the laboratories. But that, that's definitely a lot easier to manage in a laboratory environment than it is when you're out in the field. Uh, so if the primary use uh, or application of the uh, field testing is not forensic, then what is it? Um, so that's a variety of different uh, stakeholders and um, applications. They include personal safety. So um, first responders, uh, and that can be law enforcement, it can be EMS uh, personnel, uh, it could be medical examiner personnel who are attending scenes of a death or a suspected crime to ensure that they're not going to be exposed uh, to hazardous substance in that environment. Um, it can also extend to uh, harm reduction efforts. There's uh, a movement in, um, in harm reduction to institute drug checking uh, opportunities, particularly at, uh, uh, in Europe, uh, where drug testing facilities are set up at um, uh, concerts or parties where uh, people who are using uh, drugs can have them tested uh, to, to uh, uh, manage the, the risk they may be taking from consuming things they've, uh, they've acquired. Um, that is not uh, a current practice in the United States, but it is gaining momentum in, in Europe. Decisions about detaining or arresting an individual uh, in the field, if you have a test, it can be performed on site. The officer can make that uh, decision in the field. In uh, Jonathan's opening remarks, he talked about the, the burden on laboratories uh, from the opioid crisis. Uh, so if you can triage uh, in the field, the evidence you're sending to the laboratory, uh, that's going to reduce the burden on, on labs. Um, other uh, appropriate places for field use of uh, drug testing equipment would be in deployable laboratories that may be moved from location to location. Uh, you may be looking for instrumentation that's um, more uh, forgiving of uh, being set up and taken down on a more frequent basis. Uh, that's more robust in terms of being transported from place to place. Um, so that may be uh, another application. And then um, if you need to be able to do a drug identification in a, a remote site, for example, aboard uh, a ship at sea or in a mining operation on an oil rig um, where you don't have access to a laboratory, uh, that 
uh, uh, you may be, be willing to accept um, the capabilities that are available from uh, field testing devices. Uh, other considerations are uh, who's going to be performing the test. Sometimes it may be laboratorians, um, but it can be a variety of different uh, uh, professionals, emergency medical technicians, death investigators, uh, or law enforcement officers. Um, in some of the harm reduction work, it may be a, a social worker. And then in some of the security applications, it may be customs or the military. So just as the needs differ um, for uh, in, in field testing, so do the requirements of the operators. Uh, some of these folks will have a higher level of technical competence, for example, um, not just for operation, but maybe for troubleshooting and diagnostics uh, or repair of an instrument that's in the field. Um, and then different uh, capabilities and needs in terms of is it simply a black box operation or is it um, uh, something where the, the results are going to require more interpretation. Uh, so that will impact the uh, capabilities that are required of a field deployable uh, technology. And then the user environment. Um, if we go to great lengths in the laboratory to standardize and stabilize things like power, temperature, um, humidity, uh, operating on a stable surface, uh, certainly no impact from uh, weather, having appropriate lighting, for example, to read uh, the test, uh, you lose a lot of that uh, predictability when you take a test out into the field. So what is the uh, optimum technology maybe that we aspire to? Um, for those of you who don't recognize this, this is a Star Trek uh, tricorder, medical tricorder, um, that was a device that was capable of uh, making just about any measurement in any environment, giving results uh, immediately, and it always seemed to work. Um, in reality, we're not quite uh, at that level, though interestingly, some of the devices I'll show you today do bear uh, at least a passing resemblance to uh, the fictional device. So what are some of the options for uh, uh, application in field uh, drug testing and opioid detection in the field? Um, uh, progress is, is certainly being made and the technology is changing all the time. Uh, canine detection is a whole science of its own. Uh, involving detection of what's now called the volatilome, uh, uh, the volatile landscape. And uh, canines are capable of uh, detection of extremely small amounts, but even at the part per trillion uh, level of targeted compounds, including drugs and uh, explosives. Uh, from a, 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 a chemical test point of view, um, we'll go through what some of the color, current options are, chemical color tests, um, application of immunological testing uh, that's being repurposed from a toxicological application to field uh, testing for the identity of drugs. Um, and then uh, more instrumented technologies, handheld uh, FTIR and Oman, uh, field-based mass spectrometry. And then we'll conclude just by coming back and considering um, uh, what the contribution of the laboratory continues to be, even if you are uh, relying on field uh, preliminary or presumptive testing or screening. <clears throat> so the uh, chemical color tests that uh, have been a staple of uh, uh, drug identification for a number of years are actually things that were developed back in the 1800s in the very early days of uh, chemical analysis. And um, while they weren't designed necessarily for testing for drugs, but uh, more for the investigation of natural products, um, one of their persistent uses today is for field uh, detection of drugs. Um, one of the, the uh, most common drugs for the detection of uh, opioids in the field uh, is actually designed or, or can give positive reactions for a number of uh, alkaloids beside the opioids. Uh, the MECI reagent, which is a mixture of concentrated sulfuric acid and salinous acid, um, gives a, a characteristic dark bluish green uh, color when uh, exposed to uh, a number of alkaloids, including uh, heroin and morphine. So the general limitations of these uh, tests are that they can be subject to interference from other things that are not uh, controlled substances. And oftentimes the materials being tested itself may have some coloration to it. So for example, opium is a blue brown uh, tarry uh, material. 
that can make it difficult to read uh, the color change. Um, there have been modifications to some of these uh, uh, tests. Uh, that's another uh, common reagent, it's a marquee uh, reagent, which uh, is able to distinguish, for example, between fentanyl and heroin. And that is, for example, of interest to um, uh, people working in the field, uh, evaluating drugs that are in circulation amongst drug using populations uh, because of the significantly greater risk of overdose with uh, more potent drugs like fentanyl. But uh, the test has limitations. It's not good at differentiating uh, both uh, whether both drugs are present when there are mixtures present. And because many of the uh, fentanyls and its, and their, uh, its analogs and some of the newly emergent uh, uh, potent opioids are present at very low concentrations, at least in street level drug materials, uh, and may not give a distinctive color reaction. Um, also, the, the capabilities of the, the user are important uh, and the experience of the, the, uh, the person performing the test um, because the, they may have to differentiate, for example, between something that's a deep purplish red uh, versus a deep reddish brown or a strong reddish orange is the way these color changes are described and issues with color blindness or just people's uh, perception of color changes uh, can influence uh, the reliability of the conclusions that they, they draw from these tests. Um, there are uh, uh, a couple of products on the market now that have attempted to make this uh, less subjective by um, performing the color test uh, on a cassette, a, a chemical cassette, uh, and then imaging that with uh, smartphone technology, allowing the color to be interpreted by a uh, cell phone camera. Um, these devices are largely at this point proprietary. There isn't a lot of information in the public domain about their uh, performance or their uh, or, val or evidence of their validation, which would necessarily be uh, needed for forensic purposes. Uh, but it is an attempt to, to standardize the interpretation of what's a fairly basic color, a chemical color test. Um, the next uh, uh, technology I'll talk about is the use of these uh, fentanyl test strips. So they were uh, designed to be uh, dipped into urine samples uh, as part of uh, toxicological screening. And um, they uh, uh, are obviously quite sensitive. So they have appropriate sensitivity for detection of fentanyl maybe in uh, a solution of a seized material. And uh, depending on the product, they do claim cross-reactivity with a number of uh, fentanyl analogs. But that's going to vary from product to product depending on the antibody that's employed on the test strip. Um, the response may be concentration uh, dependent. And um, particularly today, uh, when we're actually, as I'll discuss later in the post-fentanyl analog era, um, uh, and, and are dealing with other uh, opioid uh, agonists, um, the antibodies that are specific for fentanyl are not going to give uh, any kind of positivity or cross-reactivity with something that is sufficiently structurally uh, different. So for color tests uh, in the field, they're attractive because of their low cost, their relatively low complexity. However, you, that's at the cost of uh, poor discriminating uh, ability um, the fact that they are not necessarily going to uh, identify all compounds that may be uh, scheduled or controlled or harmful. Um, they're going to have limited sensitivity for some of the most uh, more com uh, potent compounds. Uh, and then their, uh, their, the fact that the, the newer approaches are not extensively validated would limit uh, their application for uh, forensic purposes. And um, all of these things um, in terms of sample preparation for color tests, potentially expose the operator to uh, the substance. And there are multiple stories in uh, the media uh, about adverse effects associated with uh, that kind of exposure. This was uh, a story from last year in uh, Houston where uh, an officer picked up a, a flyer from the windshield of a vehicle uh, and started to experience some adverse effects. Um, it was suspected uh, potentially of being, uh, people were suspected of being uh, contaminated with uh, fentanyl. 
And uh, that was tested with a field test, which gave a positive result. The, the deputy was sent to the hospital uh, for treatment. But then um, a couple of days later, when the flyer actually went to the, the laboratory for uh, follow-up testing, uh, that was found to be a false positive in the field. So um, there can be significant uh, outcomes in terms of decision making, some decision points, if you don't have uh, the right kind of reliable technology in the field. So moving on to uh, higher uh, complexity testing, uh, the two uh, options really are uh, FTIR Raman or uh, mass spectrometry. Um, Raman has certainly been more successfully deployed into a, an almost tricorder looking uh, device uh, here. Um, <clears throat> that is uh, truly handheld. It can be uh, transported easily in a vehicle. It's a robust piece of equipment. Um, uh, this particular device offers both FTIR and uh, Raman, uh, so you have some complementary analytical techniques, uh, and you do get uh, a pretty good uh, uh, discrimination capability for uh, controlled substances that are in uh, the library or in the database of the device. Uh, with Raman, um, you do get some uh, reflectance back from the container, but you are able, uh, in many cases, to read through paper or through uh, a small uh, thickness of plastic uh, to get a Raman or scattered uh, spectrum from uh, the substance that's contained in the, in the container. That <clears throat> uh, reduces the risk of exposure of the, uh, the operator to the substance, uh, which is one of the things that has made this uh, technology so uh, popular. And uh, while the, the device is capable of uh, making identifications against an onboard library, uh, some uh, agencies use it simply to collect data, and the data are then sent back uh, uh, electronically to uh, a laboratory professional for assistance with uh, interpretation. Uh, this technology is evolving. There's another device on the market, uh, also handheld, that um, uh, is, is uh, capable of equivalent discrimination that uses uh, spatial offset Raman. Uh, in spatial offset, Raman, you have uh, the separation of the excitation and uh, detection uh, features of the instrument that reduces some of the back, uh, backscattering and interference and improves the signal to noise ratio. And it allows you then to take uh, a subtraction of the surface spectrum from uh, the subsurface spectrum, uh, which gives you better insight to uh, substances that are contained inside plastic or uh, paper or cardboard containers. Uh, so this gives um, uh, better capabilities for um, reading uh, or identifying the contents of uh, packaging without actually having to physically open it. Uh, so the uh, cost of the technology for in, in handheld format is pretty high. Uh, it's in the high uh, tens of thousands of dollars. Um, it is uh, of moderate complexity, so it requires some training. Uh, and judgment on the part of the person reading the results. You can mitigate that by uh, using that reach back approach. Um, it certainly is subject to interferences from mixtures. So when you have um, low concentrations of the drug uh, in, the, in the substance or in the exhibit um, with other uh, excipients or binders or adulterants, it can be difficult sometimes to see uh, the forest for the trees. Um, not so much of an issue higher up in the drug distribution chain, maybe where drugs are being imported into the country where their uh, concentrations are high, uh, but more of an issue when the uh, substance is, is further cut and diluted uh, when it's sold out on the street. And uh, with the both Raman and with uh, mass spectrometry, you're relying on having up-to-date libraries in the uh, device. And as the market changes uh, all the time, uh, it's important to keep those uh, libraries updated. Uh, handheld uh, mass spectrometry or portable mass spectrometry has been more of a challenge to get into the field. These uh, uh, historically are um, high vacuum, um, uh, somewhat fragile systems that certainly do best in a laboratory environment. So there's had to be a lot of uh, technology evolution to make them suitable for use in the field. Uh, currently, there are uh, microscale ion trap. Uh, platforms uh, available which have reduced the need for high vacuum, but they do still require uh, vacuum. So that's um, 
has a significant uh, uh, power requirement and um, uh, instrument integrity requirement. Um, samples are introduced uh, through this through thermal desorption from swabs. So you can swab uh, the environment uh, and then put it in a heated zone uh, at the uh, inlet of the instrument uh, where the mass spectrum can be uh, collected. And then there's an onboard uh, user expandable library for identification of the substances. Um, that particular device is purely a mass spectrometer. Uh, there are also some uh, now portable uh, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry platforms. Um, these are not handheld. Uh, the device shown here weighs about 40 pounds, so it's certainly portable, deployable in the field. And what you, you have in terms of a trade-off is the uh, resolving power of adding gas chromatography um, to help with the identification of more complex mixtures. Uh, this device is, uh, uh, has a microscale source, it is a, a quadrupole instrument, so it has a little more uh, stability and less sensitive to overloading than, um, than an iron trap, um, which is also more forgiving sometimes of the, the circumstances and constraints in the field. And samples are introduced by injection, which requires a little more um, uh, manual dexterity to operate. Uh, and this technology um, uh, is less configurable in terms of uh, changing column conditions or instrumental conditions than uh, the instruments we're used to using in the lab. It uh, also requires more supplies. It, it's gas chromatography, so it has a little uh, micro helium bottle uh, that needs to be uh, carried and used with the instrument. So portable mass spectrometry, moderate to high cost, um, uh, comparable cost to what the, the Roman platforms currently are. Um, very good discriminating ability, uh, also reducing the risk of the uh, uh, operator to exposure. Um, and again, uh, limitation would be reliance on uh, libraries and making sure uh, that these are up to date. With uh, uh, full uh, electron impact mass spectra, um, that does allow sometimes for the interpretation or identification of unknowns, at least to drug class, um, that's not necessarily available with the Ramon platforms. Uh, and then, of course, the lab is kind of the gold standard. Um, so many of the things that we have to compromise on in the field, um, in the lab, we have better separation signs and options. We have a much more stable environment, which allows typically for more sensitive testing, uh, safer uh, hample, handle, uh, sample handling options, uh, greater computer power, analytical power, and then access to uh, higher resolution platforms like NMR and uh, uh, accurate mass mass spectrometry. Uh, there is some work being done looking at uh, ways to make uh, sampling safer, uh, such as uh, this publication uh, that came out of NIST uh, last year uh, that has shown that you may, with more sensitive lab-based technology, be able to swab the exterior uh, packaging and get information uh, without having to actually open the package. So uh, that's some interesting work being done at NIST. Uh, so just in the last couple of minutes, I just wanted to reinforce uh, from a, a strategic point of view what some of the challenges are with field uh, analysis and how rapidly the, the uh, demands are changing. In uh, 2010, uh, we were testing for uh, a relatively small number of uh, OPIs. By uh, 2020, uh, we've gone from testing about 10 uh, to testing um, a number that changes on a weekly basis. Uh, new categories of opioid, new opioid agonist drugs are being uh, illicitly manufactured and distributed. And then analogs of uh, drug classes like fentanyl that become established um, uh, are uh, uh, manufactured and enter uh, the drug supply. So it's extremely important to be able to um, change your, update your libraries, as I mentioned, but also change your analytical capabilities uh, to keep up with that. This just demonstrates the turnover in some of the uh, illicit opioids over the last five years. Um, and you can see that they increase and decline in popularity and, uh, and uh, prevalence on about a, a six to nine month uh, cycle. Basically, as soon as the drug is identified as being harmful and is uh, scheduled, uh, the drug, illicit drug manufacturers move on uh, to other drugs. 
Um, so uh, we run a program at our, our research institute uh, identifying novel opioids as they appear in the country. We identified 12 novel opioids in 2018 and another 12 in 2019. Uh, and as you can see, uh, most of these now are not uh, fentanyl related. There was just one uh, fentanyl related uh, analog uh, that we identified as a novel opioid uh, in circulation in the United States in uh, first part of, in the latter part of 2019. Uh, the other uh, substances are uh, either drugs that have been pirated from uh, patent information or literature or publications from as long as well as the 1970s or novel analogs of those substances that, um, uh, that are now being um, introduced into the, the drug supply. Uh, so uh, that's uh, the contrast basically between what's what, what the capabilities in the laboratory versus the field are. Uh, there are definitely compromises in deploying uh, technology to the field, uh, but sometimes there's a, a compelling need for that. Really have to understand the user needs capabilities and the environment. Uh, certainly, solutions and platforms are evolving and improving. We're really only in the first uh, five to 10 years of deployment of some of these uh, technologies for this uh, purpose. Uh, although cost is uh, currently uh, a barrier to it being more extensively used. And then, um, irrespective of technology, making sure that the menu of compounds you're looking for uh, is kept up to date uh, through investigations that um, probably more suited to uh, the laboratory. Um, last slide is uh, just a reference to a publication from uh, NIJ uh, that does give uh, a landscape study uh, talking about some of those technologies and approaches that I presented in uh, this talk today. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'm going to hand you back over to our uh, moderator. Thank you very much, uh, Barry. Uh, so there are a few questions uh, that came in uh, during the presentation. Uh, I think that the one about uh, false positive negative results, you addressed uh, a little bit in the example you gave related to the flyers, um, but this will also, I believe, be very nicely addressed in the next presentation. So uh, maybe w if it does not get addressed in the end, please feel free to recast it. Uh, the ambient MS uh, question uh, was, I believe addressed it or asked before the MS section. So hopefully that was uh, covered well. Um, in addition, the uh, direct analysis in real time, time of flight MS question uh, was asked just before the example from um, the NIST work. So uh, hopefully that gave a glimpse of that. Um, but I will ask this one uh, question. What is the typical excitation wavelength for the field deployable Raman device? Um, that's something I don't have information on uh, at hand, I'm afraid. Okay, uh, then we can uh, uh, follow up with that at another time. Okay, um, it, perhaps in the interest of time and to ensure we have a ro robust uh, time for the discussion at the end, uh, we'll move on to the next presentation. Uh, so thank you very much, Barry. Um, like to introduce the final speaker, uh, Marcella Naharo, who will speak to some of the data challenges for infield detection. Uh, Ms. Naharo is a research chemist in the Surface and Trace Chemical Analysis Group at National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. She is responsible for driving the strategic direction and execution of the Forensic Science Research Program. She also manages the forensic science research program across the drugs and toxins and trace evidence portfolios. Uh, so uh, I'd like to uh, give the floor to Marcella Naharo. Uh, thank you so much for your introduction, Linda. Again, my name is Marcella Naharo from NIST, and I will be discussing the data challenges associated with the field detection of novel synthetic opioids. You could advance my slide, please. Thank you. So I'll start off with a quick uh, disclaimer. The points of view expressed in this presentation 
uh, today are my own, and they do not necessarily represent the official position um, or policies of the National Institute, Institute of Standards and Technology. Next. So before delving into data challenges, I'd like to briefly discuss quality management in forensic sciences and the differences that may exist in terms of data quality needs uh, between presumptive and confirmatory analysis. So the application of a quality system in forensic science um, supports the validity and reliability of evidence in a court of law. Nowadays, as Barry mentioned earlier, the majority of forensic laboratories meet accreditation requirements uh, that qualify the processes and procedures within um, specific laboratory systems. However, uh, quality management requirements in the field tend to be more application dependent. Um, and so as you can see, for example, for an intelligence agent or officer who's looking for, uh, to advance an investigative lead or perhaps get probable cause to open a package in interdiction efforts or make a controlled delivery under surveillance, they may only need a greater than 50% confidence uh, in that there's likelihood of a contraband being inside of that package in order to move forward. However, on the other side of the spectrum, um, if it's a forensic chemist or a forensic technician looking to do confirmatory analysis in the field, then of course the threshold is much higher. They, on the other hand, need to demonstrate uh, the validity and reliability of that tool um, that they're utilizing and the results that they'll get from that. Next slide. So regardless of the intended application, field drug data can in fact impact criminal proceedings. A federal survey in 2013 found that about 62% of crime labs do not um, test drug evidence when the defendant has already pled guilty. There's a myriad of reasons why defendants uh, take pleas rather than take their chances in a court um, in terms of their sentencing. Um, that's uh, obviously uh, beyond the scope of this presentation, but it's important to note that a large number of jurisdictions across the United States accept guilty pleas based on field results um, alone. And as Dr. Logan already discussed, those results could have been obtained by a gradient of technologies that differ in their capabilities, right? Um, and so I think we could all agree that perhaps it, it, there's a need to raise the bar. So field technology needs rigorous validation methods and data to demonstrate its validity and reliability, much like uh, laboratory uh, quality management dictates. And as you know, the scientific community, we understand that the way to raise the bar is through measurement science, through um, reference standards and standardizing methods. So as I continue to discuss quality management in the field, I will touch on how each of these areas that you see here um, can in fact affect uh, data quality. In particular, when we're talking about complex samples, such as fentanyl. Um, the first topic is sampling. Um, and, so, and why standardizing sampling methods is in the field is important. Uh, next slide. So the number one reason is because sampling can impact your data quality. If you're talking about using a trace detector, if you put too large of a sample in there, it can actually cause a shift. It can shift your characteristic peaks, and it could also produce additional non-representative peaks, which could lead to a misidentification. When you're talking about techniques such as the color test, uh, too large of samples can saturate the color changes, making it more difficult for the end user to uh, be able to differentiate uh, between the color changes and the interpretation of that result. The second reason is um, safety. And this is a specific concern with the fentanyl. Um, click. Um, if you, if Recruiter and Al uh, recently developed a standard method for sampling bulk materials in the field, using a fine needle probe. Um, this is actually a biopsy punch that's used in the medical field to obtain uh, biopsy samples. But there's a few studies who have already adopted this standard method of sampling, and it provides two great um, resources, right? It provides exposure, it reduces the exposure risk of the end user instead of opening a big uh, seizure and potentially aerosolizing particles and become exposed to the, um, the threat, um, so it creates a barrier there, and it also increases reproducibility of your sampling. So on the next slide, a pillar in quality assurance is the validation process. And while instrument manufacturers may do a basic product, uh, product validation prior to launching a new product or a new technology, um, end users are really best served by independent validation of field technology. 
So in this case, um, Angelini et al., they're from the U.S. Army Aberdeen Proving Grounds, evaluated the effectiveness of commercially available um, lateral flow amino assays uh, that Dr. Logan mentioned earlier. These are designed to detect the synthetic opioid fentanyls in either urine or saliva. In this case, the performance metrics that they decided to uh, measure were uh, limits of detection, and they had test, 10 test compounds for that. They also um, evaluated cross-reactivity. Um, they wanted to see whether they could still detect the compounds after in vivo exposure. In this case, they used rabbits. And they did a limited uh, testing as to whether the um, LFIs would detect the fentanyls in adjudicated real-world samples. And so it was nice to see that the um, authors went beyond uh, testing pure compounds and, in fact, also uh, assessed how they would do with uh, real-world samples, for example, in a forensic laboratory or in the field. Um, a second example of a validation framework um, in the next slide is uh, a work that uh, Recruiter and et al. did for ion mobility spectrometers. So these are technology that's already been deployed uh, to, um, for example, uh, interdiction efforts because they detect explosives. Uh, most of them are dual mode and can also detect um, drugs in the positive mode. And so they were trying to boost those efforts by adding these fentanyls into the libraries and also evaluate the capabilities that they may have for this particular application. Um, there's a need for standard methods in order for end users to be able to compare and validate performance using common metrics. Um, something that I want to highlight from this study is that the way they based what, uh, their sample set and what compounds they were going to test the equipment on was based on um, DEA's uh, NIFLIS, is in, as Jonathan mentioned earlier, that's the National Forensic Laboratory Information System, and they have data um, regarding the drug seizure um, from crime labs. And so it was actually a really informed way in terms of selecting what people typically see um, in terms of drug seizures and what may be being infiltrated through our borders or through the mail. Um, they also moved away just from testing pure compounds and added um, um, other additives. So in this case, we're talking about your heroin, your procrine, quinine. A lot of times those will be found in mixtures with um, the fentanyls, and they also added um, commercial, uh, pharmaceutical formulations that may test uh, for false positives. Finally, they identified a compound, uh, benzyl fentanyl, to use for sensitivity, and in this case, they did so for uh, because it's safer. Even though it's you know 17th on the list in this list, um, it is considered safer because of its lower potency. So this method proposed here provides a very basic level of validation for the detection of fentanyls and other fentanyl-related um, substances on IMS. Um, it uh, allows end users to continue to build on their library. It has resolution measurements and also provided um, limits of detection in a, uh, in a very standard way. And the next slide, you'll see that uh, standard terminology and a robust measurement platform allows for end users to be able to compare, you know, apples to apples when they're trying to decide which technology best suits their needs. So in this case, because there's already a method where the LOG is very defined, users can have data-driven procure can make data-driven procurement decisions. Um, ASTM 2677 um, describes a, describe a web-based tool that's meant for manufacturers, vendors, testing labs, and end users to um, to estimate a robust limit of detection. Um, this standard was recently updated in 2020 to include some of these fentanyls as well. And what I like about this tool, um, again, it's web-based, so it's very accessible. It's extremely user-friendly. Um, it pops up with your statistics afterwards and um, your measurement uncertainty. But also, and if you click one more time, um, this web tool has a data quality check. And so if the data quality is marginal that an end user has put in there to, to make their calculation, a message will provide suggestions on how to improve that quality. And once you've met that quality um, standard, then the web tool will perform the calculation and return a 90% upper confidence um, LOD90, what we call an LOD90, including a measurement of uncertainty. Um, next slide. Um, so even though it's, you know, as Barry said, we're really building on this foundation of improved uh, testing methods and validation efforts, they don't all address the expected um, sources of error that arise when technology is actually deployed into the field. 
So there's, here's a three ways that you can consider to bolster either validation protocols in the laboratory or further verification that may take place once the, um, the instruments have been deployed. One of them is potentially adding standard DIRT to your testing. Um, yes, NIST has three different ty uh, a couple of different types of standard DIRT uh, that represent different regions of the country. And the reason this is important is because DIRT may be included in the matrix um, of when you do your sample collection. And so you wanna have a really good idea as to how this may be inter uh, cause interference or maybe serve as a masking agent on your type of technology. Um, second, um, a study that was referenced earlier, Cisco et al. Um, were um, considering looking, uh, proposing perhaps sampling the outside of the bag to reduce risk and uh, to the analyst of opening these packages. And so could the outside contents of the bag predict what's in, inside of the package? So they also tested contaminants that are expected to be found outside of plastic bags to see um, whether that affected their um, ability to predict the inside contents. And finally, Forbes uh, measured the contribution of environmental background to instrument, to instrument response by um, partnering with a, a field deployed instrument and analyzing a large number of true negative samples in order to understand, um, to create rock curves and um, better understand false positives. But following a thorough controlled validation in the lab, infield verification uh, must also be performed in the operational environment in which the instrument has been deployed. Um, a lot of these instruments already have an internal calibrant that accounts for shifts that can occur as a function of temperature, humidity, or pressure. Um, but I think where, where there's still a need uh, to improve is in our use of quality controls or quality checks to ensure that as a function of time, your instrument has not declined in performance and, um, and have those metrics available. And so, of course, in the laboratory, we're very used to having positive, running positive controls, negative controls. Um, but a potential challenge with having a positive control here is that, of course, the safety, right? So having these uh, materials out in the field um, with known fentanyls in them could provide some, some potential issues. Um, another critical thing to do once your instrument has been uh, deployed to its operational environment is to continue to fine tune or even customize your detection thresholds. Um, if you're operating in an environment that's you know, known to have higher drug background levels, then your detection parameters should really reflect that. Um, this includes uh, border crossings, international mail facilities, you would think that your drug background level there is going to be higher. So you want to have that into consideration um, in order to be able to reduce your false positives. One other thing that I will add is that this data is extremely valuable to instrument manufacturers. And so I would encourage end users to share um, this background data with them in order for them to create um, better algorithms and even smarter um, data analytics. There have been several studies that have measured drug background levels in public spaces. And so um, that can inform end users, you know, what type of sensitivity are they really looking for in technology and what should they be targeting? Um, a lot of them, uh, end users will get trace detectors, but their background levels um, just do not, um, are not good for that. They need more of a bulk material um, detection levels. Um, Next slide discusses in the field of forensic science, evidence data management is um, critical because it ensures that the results are gonna be court admissible, but also provides the defense with an opportunity to review the original data. And so the three main goals are to protect the validity and accuracy of the data, to maintain that chain of custody, and to comply with evidence retention laws. Um, these vary depending on uh, your jurisdiction but it's something to definitely keep in mind. Uh, manufacturers, I think, understand pretty well these unique requirements of forensic sciences, and so they've come up with data solutions that um, automatically store the results for reporting or for evidence submissions, and they also include some uh, metadata included in the data files, such as time, um, date stamps, and some even include um, coordinates as to where you were when you took that sample. In the next slide, um, I discussed uh, something that I mentioned earlier, which is that ASTM standard that's being um, developed for field detection of fentanyls. Um, I think this is going to be a really great resource for the community. It's being drafted by the committee E54 of Homeland Security and supported by DHS Science and Technology. 
Um, it's mainly for first responders, but why, why I think it's going to be so valuable is because it includes active participation from vendors and from subject matter experts. So everybody's coming together to really understand what type of requirement document is going to be needed um, that satisfies both the manufacturers and the end users. This effort is being led by um, Pacific Northwestern National Lab. And again, it will define your testing protocols. It will define acceptable error rates for instruments that are deployed and, of course, provide some um, safety guidance. So shifting gears a little bit now to discuss some detection strategies for the field detection of drugs and what increased complexities um, do we face by detecting fentanyls in the field. So as Barry mentioned earlier, there's definitely some interpretation challenges that arise from uh, novel synthetic uh, opioids. The data acquired in the field can differ significantly from what the libraries have, and so therefore there's a need for enhanced data analytics especially for those applications that uh, where the end user needs to be able to differentiate between um, analogs or isomers. So, um, and, and then as Barry also mentioned, sometimes these things are being operated by non-technical operators. And so, you know, some of the things that can add to those complexities is, as you mentioned, um, fentanyls are almost, you know, unless you have a pure sample that's coming in it, through interdiction efforts, it's in, with multi-drug mixtures, and so you have issues such as competitive ionization, um, peak resolution because of those trade-offs that you have to make for um, instruments to be able to be buildable. Um, when we try and keep our end users safe and perhaps um, try and do the analysis through uh, packaging, for example, then you need to be worried about um, clear versus opaque packaging, any fluorescence issue that may arise from that, and of course the environmental contributions that your contaminants, dirt, um, et cetera, have on your, um, on your analysis. Um, so the data analytics for the detection of novel synthetic opioids requires really a, a layered approach. First, it's obtaining that traceable and reliable reference data of these novel substances. And as Jonathan mentioned, these need, this needs to be done on a timely basis, right? So we need to keep up with how uh, frequently they're being synthesized and entering the drug market. Um, that reference data can then be used as label data to populate threat libraries and to make them more robust, or you can use them to train algorithms. However, due to the structural similarity of these analogs and you know, the, those potential resolution issues that we expect from field equipment, um, it's probably wise to also consider machine learning because it can um, aid in predicting that a novel substance is likely a fentanyl derivative. And finally, uh, there's a need to validate statistical models using real-world data in order for, um, for developers to continue to improve that initial feature selection that they, um, that they use. So um, one of the challenges in the ever-changing landscape of synthetic opioids is, as I mentioned, the availability of reference standards. Um, luckily, CDC has seek to address this challenge by developing and distributing um, what they call POM kits, which are traceable opioid materials. They include 150 opioids and 100 fentanyl analogs. And while these kits were uh, manufactured uh, trying to support the needs of the forensic laboratories, I think they can also be um, extremely useful to, um, to manufacturers who are looking to add to their threat libraries and also end users. Um, these, key, these kits are freely available uh, to the U.S. labs in a variety of domains, uh, as long as you have a DEA registration for a Schedule I uh, substance. So one potential challenge there is that instrument manufacturers don't always have the DEA um, license and therefore not privy getting these samples. Um, in terms of housing reference data under one roof, uh, NIST recently collaborated with the DEA and also the BKA from Germany, and they developed a web-based, community-driven um, analytical data repository. So here, of course, the, the thought is that there's a need for reliable data in order to identify these novel substances that are being synthesized. Um, here, we're using a community approach, and so the global forensic community here would help to facilitate the identification of these unknown substances and at the same time, eliminate duplication of, of elucidation efforts. Um, and so then you have to consider uh, providing some guidelines in terms of what samples um, you'd like. So they've identified sort of three tiers of samples. Ideally, uh, the, the reference data comes from a reference material. 
uh, that's been purchased from a commercial supplier with a lot number and a catalog number, but it could also be an internal control material where it's produced by an institution and hopefully also has a lot number. And finally, the last tier is an exhibit or a seed material. Um, here you're looking for reasonable purity. But in either case, there is a validation um, step where uh, quality metrics already are in place, and so there's uh, more trust in that data. So once you have the reference data for these new substances, they can be used to identify, um, again, to test those algorithms that you already have, those existing algorithms, and understand whether they have the right feature selection in order to predict um, and identify the right content. Um, for instance, if your detection scheme is based on identifying two or three backbone structures, you can validate your feature selection uh, using this data. Um, and the next slide, uh, enhancing uh, machine learning. I think this is an important um, concept to discuss. Uh, the reason to perhaps enlist machine learning is because we need to build richer test data sets um, using real world samples. Um, this can help improve or help you validate the robustness of your statistical model. So um, here somebody builds um, a statistical model, they test it with their clean data, but then they also use real world data that, they can, that can help refine um, what the feature selection of this model and then it continues in an, in an iterative form. Of course, there's always challenges with this. Um, this requires continuous data sharing uh, from a variety of entities. Um, as Jonathan mentioned earlier, uh, partnerships here are very important because everybody has sort of a piece of the puzzle. Um, standard issues with any time you're gonna have some data sharing, what platform are you gonna use, standard data format, and you know, who maintains it. In this case, um, access could be problematic because some information could be considered law, law enforcement sensitive and public health sensitive. Um, but here, I think that you know, forensic labs hold a big piece of the puzzle. They have whatever's being seized. They have that piece of information. Medical examiners um, also have a piece of information because they know what um, folks have been overdosing in um, hospitals, you know, non-fatal overdoses. And finally, intelligence agents have a really good idea of what's um, been coming in through our borders or through the mail facility. Anytime you're designing a tool and um, you're doing so from the comfort of your library and um, of, of your um, laboratory, you have to consider what is going to, what is it going to take in order to throw this over the fence and actually um, operationalize it. And so there's two things, uh, software in, in terms of what we're talking about right now, software accessibility and education and training. So um, in order to continue to make strides in data analytics at the rate required, it's going to really take a village. Um, software, uh, so software and algorithms need to be open and transparent. This allows for them to be freely available um, and it facilitates accessibility, adoption, and scalability. Here's an example of um, a, Arun Murthy from NIST recently published an open source software implementation. Um, it generates mass spectral similarity mappings of unknowns against a library of type one fentanyl analog spectra. Um, those are just molecules that differ from fentanyl by a single modification. The goal is that by making it open source, more end users can evaluate its utility in its current state. They can aid in the validation of that statistical model that supports it. And then the result is hopefully a better product for the community. Next is that um, trials of facts are already looking for decision-making algorithms to be more transparent to the public and have um, a higher level of documentation that discusses what the um, assumptions are based on the data, uh, what their limitations are, and also what are the feature characteristics that support that model. Um, a recent um, federal judge asked the New York Crime Lab to unseal um, their, their algorithms they were using to analyze data. And so this tells us that that's where um, this movement is heading towards. Um, and so of course, education and training needs to be a part of this. End users uh, need to have a basic level of understanding of the decision-making tools that they're gonna utilize. Um, they need to understand what sort of false positive and false negative rates they're gonna get using these. Um, and, and then what are the limitations of those tools? All of those are, are I think, a unique um, concern for forensic scientists who have to go and testify in a courtroom and, and they need to have a good understanding when they're using these algorithms. So in conclusion, um, 
field data can be indirectly used beyond its intended scope. And so we need to um, try and bolster the quality management system, um, just like we do in the laboratory, into the field when possible. Uh, you know, questions still remain of what that quality management criteria should be for uh, criminal investigative purposes, right? So when we're only looking for probable cause, um, again, that, that, um, that threshold is, is lower than if we're looking to confirm a result in the field. Um, how do we ensure that these quality systems that we're looking to uphold don't impede the adoption of new technologies, right? It's always that gray area when we want to pilot new technology and we want to see its capabilities um, in real world situations. How do we adjust um, our quality checks in order to allow for that to come in online? Um, how do we manage the trade-offs of field technology and that very high threshold of admissibility requirements in a court of law? Um, so, as you saw, there's a lot of different uh, researchers and other academics that are working to strengthen field quality management and to mirror, you know, that of, of what's going on in the laboratory. I think, again, that ASTM standard of the field detection of first fentanyl, that's going to be a really good resource for the community, and I'm excited for that to come out and see how the community responds. And then finally, um, in order to enhance detection strategies, we have to think outside of just using um, libraries and consider using machine learning and then, of course, data sharing, um, open source software, and education and training go hand in hand. With that, I'd like to acknowledge um, my colleagues and the peers whose work I reference, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Marcella. Uh, so at this point, we're going to move into the discussion portion of the webinar. Uh, just to remind the audience, you can submit questions uh, through the Q&A button on Zoom at the bottom of your screen. Um, or if you're not on Zoom, then you can email questions to csr at nas.edu as shown on the screen there. Um, we've already had some questions uh, come through, and so I'll go ahead and uh, begin the discussion portion. Um, perhaps throwing out um, a question, you know, Jonathan really highlighted the pace at which these uh, structures are emerging. Uh, and so maybe I'll open this up to anybody, but given the ever-changing landscape of structures, um, are there prospects for an assay, perhaps based on biological activity, rather than having to keep up with this pace of structures? Um, this is Barry Logan. Let me go ahead and uh, uh, give you some uh, response to that. So that is uh, uh, an area of uh, ongoing research. Um, as I mentioned with um, uh, the, the, the repurposing of immunoassay test strips or immunoassay kits uh, to try to identify opioids, the limitation of that is that the antibodies are a lot more selective in terms of their binding than um, than the receptors are. So receptors are going to be activated by uh, a variety of different kinds of uh, chemistries with some commonality in terms of structure activity and relationship. That's what makes them uh, uh, effective agonists. Um, so if we could uh, develop an assay that uh, um, uh, was based on receptor binding rather than on uh, antibody binding, um, it can conceivably bind things that we haven't encountered before, but we still we know are still going to be active at, uh, as opioids. So there is some work uh, going on at uh, the University of Ghent. Uh, a colleague of, uh, of ours here, Christoph Stoll, is looking at um, uh, ways to, to develop biological or assays for biological activity of substances rather than uh, identifying them based on their chemical uh, structure. So in terms of a screening method, I think that has a lot of promise. Uh, there are issues to be um, uh, to be addressed. For example, since um, the receptor is going to bind both agonists and antagonists, uh, if you're trying to use a receptor-based assay to um, determine somebody's drug use, but they may also have been administered Narcan, um, then you're going to get a response both from the Narcan and from the, uh, the active opioid. But it uh, certainly has uh, the potential uh, to be useful for uh, the identification of new previously uh, unknown um, uh, opioid agonists. 
thank you very much. Um, it, the uh, maybe on this theme of sort of alternate uh, detection strategies, there's a question: uh, Are there any viable electrochemical detection strategies uh, that are being looked at and thinking about? Um, kind of continuous, minimally invasive transdermal analysis uh, using microelectric needles as a monitoring for, re for relapse, can those perhaps be uh, adopted and adapted for detection in the field? Um. This is Barry Logan again. I, I can tell you that there are some commercial products uh, in development that are based on electrochemical um, uh, uh, techniques, cyclic voltammetry, uh, and looking at uh, characteristic um, uh, potentials for the identification of, of uh, opioids. Um, it certainly is not currently um, deployed or deployed technique. And I'm not aware of any commercial devices that are in use or on sale that, that employ that approach. But um, the, the opioid uh, crisis has um, spurred a lot of uh, research into alternate uh, technologies, particularly those that may be uh, more amenable to, uh, to field deployment. Um, Jonathan uh, mentioned in his uh, opening remarks the um, the opioid detection challenge uh, that NIST and um, uh, NIJ and Homeland Security uh, had launched uh, last year, which was really to encourage um, technology developers and, and uh, uh, academic researchers to apply uh, techniques or technologies that maybe haven't in the past been used, particularly um, attractive is the idea of passive sensing. So being able to uh, detect uh, somehow, for example, in uh, in the mail or in um, uh, with packages uh, uh, on a on a conveyor belt in a mail sorting facility, um, is there a technology uh, either that can see through packaging and detect drugs, or that can detect uh, trace amounts of drugs in the environment? Um, NIST, I know, has done some work on uh, techniques to dislodge uh, surface trace materials from packaging. Uh, into the air where they may be detected by a variety of techniques. Um, so uh, the challenge uh, is new and the need for innovative technology is, is new. Uh, and there are uh, definitely, uh, there's definitely interest on the part of, of organizations like NIJ in uh, trying to bring um, some of those technologies to bear on uh, what might be uh, historically have been considered more forensic uh, purposes. The second part of your, your question, I'm probably not uh, able to answer. Um, yeah, then I can uh, move to a different, uh, slightly different topic uh, that seems to be of great interest to the audience. Um, Marcella, you really perhaps covered this in its entirety, but let me pose the, the two questions that came in related to um, this idea of false positives and false negatives. So, you know, how are the risks of false positive negative results assessed and established for both field and laboratory tests? Um, and then related to that, is there a standardized decision tree for recommending confirmatory testing after a positive field test? I think you, you gave us a, a summary there, but perhaps this would be an area for additional comment. Um, sure. So I think what I could add is just making sure that your um, validation protocol includes as many uh, compounds that are known to potentially uh, cause a false positive. Um, and, you know, there's because they're going to be found in drug mixtures, and even um, if you're thinking about counterfeit um, type of samples, there's going to be um, there's going to be other pharmaceutical formulations associated with your sample. You really need to have a, a really thorough uh, validation uh, plan that includes all of these compounds. Um, and, you know, just like anything else, 
it's, it's just important to measure that and to understand what some of your limitations um, are going to be. Um, I think that that um, that initial that validation framework that I referenced um, from Recruiter and Nadal actually takes that into consideration and gives um, some metrics in terms of what false positive rates um, to expect um, from that particular technology. So I can definitely see that being used um, to validate other types of technologies. And then um, secondarily was, you know, when I touched on really having a good understanding of what your operational environment, the challenges that that's going to um, bring to you in terms of chemical background. Um, a lot of times, you know, the, the the dichotomy here is that fentanyl is found at a much lower concentration because of their potency. And so you have to have an analytical technique that's going to actually be able to pick that up in the presence of other uh, drugs as well. And so it's difficult for end users sometimes to gauge what level of uh, detection they need, whether they're looking for trace detectors or something mid-range or even bulk. And, and so that's a particular challenge that these types of samples bring. Um, but I just would highly encourage um, that validation to go beyond what's done in a laboratory and to also um, do some testing once the instrumentation has been operationalized and again, customize or fine tune your detection parameters based on that. Um, the, the only other thing I'll add is that uh, your background, it tends to change as a function of time. And so this could perhaps just sort of be part of your quality management that at a certain interval, you're going to continue to monitor what your background looks like and sort of continuously tweak um, your detection threshold um, and monitor that signal to noise so that you can minimize your false positives. Um, just to, to uh, uh, Marcella's uh, point, um, another consideration is uh, considering what the application is and what your tolerance for false positives uh, or false negatives is under different circumstances. So. For example, if you're uh, a first responder and you want to know whether an environment is safe to go into, uh, you would have um, fairly low tolerance for, for false negatives, um, maybe a little more tolerance for false positives, the decision just being either to apply more uh, uh, personal protective equipment, as opposed to if you're using the test to make a decision about whether to place somebody under arrest. Um, you may have a different tolerance for a false positive, particularly if, uh, or if you're using the test as a screening test and you know that there's going to be uh, a more discriminating confirmatory test uh, done in the laboratory. So um, that's something that the user really has to determine based on their, their application also. Thank you both. Um, now I'll, I'll pose a question that came in uh, that uh, looks very globally at this issue and asks, what is the current status in the area of source, source apportionment of illicit drugs? If anyone uh, can comment on that. Um, I can uh, comment on it a little. Um, there are programs in place. Um, by it's one that, the, uh, that has been run at the DEA, a special testing lab for a number of years, uh, looking at um, uh, signature uh, analysis of uh, traffic drugs um, based on all kinds of properties, everything from um, the presence of adulterants to the presence of uh, byproducts that might tell you something about the uh, method of manufacture um, to trace metals that are present in uh, different batches of drugs that may allow you to uh, uh, identify things that are coming from a common source uh, up to and including the use of stable isotope ratio mass spectrometry for identifying uh, where um, natural products may have grown by uh, what regions of the world based and that discrimination can be made based on um, the incorporation of different stable isotopes um, so uh, there are a number of ways to uh, to make that assessment. There are some things, for example, stable isotope analysis that are more applicable in the um, analysis of, of natural products. 
than they are in synthetic drugs because the synthetic precursors could come from all over the world and be shipped someplace and then assembled into the final um, uh, molecule. But uh, that's definitely an area of active research, and I think there's a lot more that can be, uh, be done there. Thank you. Uh, so might want to uh, build on Marcella talking about uh, machine learning and data analysis and computation. Uh, there was a question posed uh, uh, along these lines. Um, it's possible these days to use computational chemistry, you know, not machine learning, but uh, computational chemistry with, that can give spectra uh, with almost experimental accuracy. So is this also being brought to bear as a, uh, in the toolbox for drug detection, complementing experimental efforts? Um, I'm not aware of that, although um, there was somebody, I think, at, uh, at UC Berkeley who was considering uh, that application, but I'm not quite sure how far they've gotten in, into those efforts. Do you know of anybody, um, Barry, who's using that? Um, no, I don't, not currently. But I think it's an excellent idea and that, again, that could be another tool in your toolbox, as you mentioned. Yep, sounds good. Uh, there's a question uh, that came in. What are the current efforts leading to the creation of robust measurement infrastructure for untargeted analysis of emerging drugs? I think this really can speak to anyone on the panel. This is Jonathan. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, the, one of the uh, the links in the final slide of the overview included a uh, a paper that was published, I believe, within the last year. It's tomorrow at all, and I believe uh, Barry Logan and myself contributed as co-authors, and it really talks about what a holistic approach to developing a robust system can look like. Uh, simply based not only on the types of technologies we've discussed today, but also looking at the stakeholders and when and how they use that information. Uh, so I believe that that might be a good place uh, to start as well as the needs assessment. Uh, but really this comes down to uh, this concept of developing systems based approaches across all stakeholders, customers and users of the data and collectors of the information. And in some ways it needs to be uh, somewhat jurisdiction dependent based on the needs and the resources available within a community. Um, the New Jersey uh, Drug Monitoring Initiative or DMI is a really good example of how New Jersey has reached across all of its public health and public safety stakeholders to share information. So those types of uh, resources might be a, a good thing to check out. It sounds like a great uh, recommendation for the audience. Um, so we're nearing the end of our time, uh, the end of our webinar. Uh, there was a question that came in from via the email um, I think, uh, related to Barry's presentation. What is the best color metric uh, app and available on various platforms, iPhone, Android? Uh. I think I'm going to uh, uh, pass on a comment on any particular vendor's technology. Okay, uh, fair enough. There, there are uh, a number of these in development. Um, as I've said, I'm not familiar, and I've done some looking, I'm not familiar with any published um, validation of the, the technology. Um, but it certainly is an attractive evolution uh, for over uh, current uh, chemical color test because it does remove some of the subjectivity and uh, makes the the assessment of the color change a little more systematic. Um, so I think I think development of cell phone based or smartphone based technologies, um, maybe it's related to color tests, maybe it's related to other uh, uh, kinds of chemical uh, processes that can be done in the field. I think that's uh, a fruitful area for exploration. Thank you. I appreciate that uh, insight. Uh, so at this point, I'd uh, just like to thank everyone uh, who has tuned in and also for the three speakers for really providing an insightful uh, overview and, and detail about this exciting area. I uh, just want to note that the three presentations and the recording of the webinar will be posted to the Chemical Sciences Roundtable website by the end of the 
the week. Uh, and so that uh, URL is on, the, on your screen. Uh, there were some more questions that were residing in the, in the Q&A. So this is obviously an area of great interest. Um, if anyone has any additional questions, comments, or concerns, uh, you can email the CSR at nas.edu um, email address that's also on the screen. And uh, look for you to mark your calendars for a date to be TBD, but our next webinar will be held in June and we'll cover issues within the chemical supply chain. And so for more information, make sure to subscribe for updates, uh, which can be done also on the website. Uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, close the session and again, thank the participants uh, for the excellent presentations.